Alrighty, what's up y'all? We have another installment of the final answer series. Today we're gonna to be talking about basic principles and techniques that you need to have with bench pressing that aren't even like advanced cues. It's honestly something that you should be doing if you're bench pressing. So that breaks down into two main categories. One is good scapular movement and good scapular positioning. We're gonna talk about that first. This is gonna be a topic of discussion that has just been something that is so misapplied and so misinformed in strength and conditioning. We've all heard the phrase, retract your scapula, do all this and all that, all that bullshit on bench press, and then people end up with hurt shoulders. That's what they were trying to prevent. We're gonna talk about that, and then the enigma that is leg drive. So first and foremost, you have to understand what your scapula is. It's these fucking things that are like, I guess you could say Dorito shaped bones in your back that contribute to you being able to roll your shoulders forward and backward. Basically, it's a galaxy brain way of saying you're rolling your shoulders forward, it's protracting, putting them back is retracting. When they're fully retracted, your scapulas are most, clo most close together. When they're neutral, they're neutral. They're just where they're supposed to be at. And then when they're fully protracted, that's when they're farthest apart. So when you're in a bench press, you wanna be able to move from neutral to protracted, back to neutral, seamlessly and effectively. Where neutrality comes into play is something that we're gonna cover in a second, but we need to be able to talk about how to cue this specifically. If you're someone that has difficulty retracting your scapula and moving it back to neutral, there's a movement that is very intuitive that's going to be an easy fix for that. It's just a weighted push-up or any sort of push-up that allows you to go through this very intuitively. Once you get that tactile sensation of your scaps moving around, then that's when you can start to apply these other things that we're going to talk about. But if you're someone that struggles with the protraction, rolling your shoulders forward, an exercise that is just really intuitive for cueing that is any sort of row where you can very intuitively let your arm roll forward and then you pull it back. That actually cues that retraction and protraction simultaneously. So those two, the push up, either weighted or you know with body weight or any sort of row where you're really allowing for a full stretch and then a full squeeze. Protraction is a full stretch. Retraction is a full squeeze. It's just an easy way of thinking about it. Neutral is just neutral. You're not doing anything with it. That out of the way, though, there's an important reason why you don't want to necessarily fully protract, which is where the boomers come into play when they just say fully retract your scapula and keep it there. But there's a reason why you need to press from this angle as well. So we'll just go ahead and take the opportunity to draw like a... Uh, so if I was looking at you from your head back, this is what your bench would look like if you're properly set up. So on your unrack, your arms are perfectly straight. That's your little peanut head. And here's the bar. This is an anatomically strong way to unrack your bench press. Why is that? Your arms are fully locked and you're not relying on your pec minor and all these weak support systems to support what could potentially be 300 pounds, 400 pounds, 500 pounds. This is what an anatomically weak unrack looks like. You're fully retracted and to one degree or another, you are anatomically not going to be capable of locking out your arms. Now the degree of severity in terms of that is just gonna be dependent upon the person. I made it kind of obvious, just for demonstration's sake. So you see right here, this is a straight line. This is an angle. There's a few things wrong with that. So first and foremost, you're not properly loading your tricep here because it's not fully contracted. And because it's not fully contracted, you're not able to rely on your bone structure as a support system to assist you with your unwrap. That's going to make for bad positioning. It's going to make for elbow pain. It's going to make for shoulder pain because here, we'll just draw a quick 
anatomy diagram over here in this corner. Here's what you're working with in terms of your upper body musculature relating to your bench press. We're not going to draw the whole, the whole upper body, just the relevant musculature. So when you unrack, you're supported here, here, in your tricep, and in your elbows. All of that collectively, all together, is creating a rock solid unit of stability that's gonna make you the strongest and give you the safest way to press. If you're eliminating this and this, you just lost two immense support systems with your unrack. So when you remove support systems, these are going to have to overcompensate. That's when your deeper chest fibers, your pec minor and your shoulder start to overcompensate. These muscles were not designed to hold all this weight <laughs> without the aid of these or else we wouldn't have evolved to have these support musculature and you know joints and bones and shit. Here's why that's important and here's where retraction and protraction comes into play. So this is buying away the cue that gets the most resistance on social media when you talk about it, because we're all told from boomer powerlifters, Mike, the Mike, the Mark Ripitos, the the fucking we all know these uh, the, these Mucinex booger built ass fucking boomer powerlifters that tell us to just retract and then don't move it there. Here's the problem with that: when you're fully retracted, you're not anatomically able to fully lock your elbow. You can try right now, fully retract, and then stick your arms out and try to fully extend your elbows. You're not gonna be able to do that. You're gonna have to fight against your body's structure to do that. That's where these pec minor injuries come into play. That's where these elbow injuries come into play. So instead of you starting from a retracted state, you're neutral. And you're doing this instead. I talk about this in another video. Well, I had to delete it because of YouTube and copyright and all that. And I didn't want to get a strike. But we're talking about it now. So on your setup, this is just the easiest way I can explain it to you. You're creating that preeminent pressure by sitting onto your neck and your traps. And that's how you're creating that initial stability. You potentiate that through doing an arch and through leg drive, which we're going to talk about in a second. Now, when you descend, you bring the bar down. As you bring the bar down, you retract your scapula. You pinch your shoulder blades together. That's where people say that rows have carryover to bench press. This is why rowing has carryover to bench press. Here's the rub, though. So if you're only retracting you're missing half the plot. You have to move these scaps back to neutral so that you have an efficient way to fully lock your elbows or else you're defeating the purpose of you starting with this position where you're just sitting back onto your traps. You protract back to neutral. You don't fully protract because that's dangerous. You're not gonna have any sort of stability with your press. You just protract back to neutral. That's how you employ retraction and protraction into your bench press. So to summarize, pressing from retraction bad, pressing from neutral is good, pressing from a protracted state is also bad. You wanna master that movement and know what each of those positions feels like intrinsically, and that just comes with practice. My recommendation is, is that you employ two main exercises to get a tactile sensation for your scapula moving around in their three main positions relating to pressing. Push-ups, rows, those are the two main ones. Now we talked about leg drive and how that contributes to a stable setup on bench press. It's not necessary, but it is optimal for creating the most stable, the most braced bench press that you possibly can. You can still sit onto your traps on a Larson press 
it's just not going to be anywhere near as stable. So that's what we're going to talk about now is leg drive. And this is the enigma that just has evaded everybody because nobody knows how to use leg drive unless they learn how to do it. All right, so now for the leg drive portion. This is going to give uh, everyone that watches it that doesn't know how to use leg drive or is quite inconsistent with it or just uses it sometimes on accident. Maybe when they're about to fail the last rep of a really high rep set or something like that. Now, just to tell you what good leg drive should feel like, I have uh, created this giga ripped guy with some pinched glutes uh, in some tight shorts so that you can see what muscles should be contracting. So I guess we'll start with the peanut ass here. When you're employing proper leg drive, you should feel your glutes. You should also feel your hamstrings. You're also going to feel your quads. You're going to feel your lower back. And then you're going to feel tension on, on to your upper traps and your neck as well. A properly executed bench press is not just an upper body lift. It is just as uncomfortable as a properly executed slack pull on a deadlift. It's just as uncomfortable as a squat. When you're employing every strategy that you can use to lift the most amount of weight possible, that doesn't come at the cost of it, the, the lift being comfortable. Larson pressing is very comfortable. It's not anywhere near as much total body tension and there's a reason why, you know, when you're stronger that you employ it that we didn't talk about in that Larson press video. When you're executing properly employed leg drive, the lower back is the bridge. So it starts in your legs, it goes into your lower back and into your core, and it ends in your upper body pressing musculature. If I could compare it to something, it's like the difference between bracing on a deadlift and not bracing on a deadlift. You're going to have an immense difference in your capacity to lift weight. Now, how do you achieve this bridging effect? Okay, so it's intuitive to create an arch. You could all probably just extend your back right now and flex your lower back muscles. That's not hard to do. It's also not very hard to sit onto your traps, but it's the transition from here to here to here that eludes people. Leg drive is essentially this. It doesn't matter how you do it. There are some things that you want to feel for starting from your feet. So a lot of people, when they start off with leg drive, just arbitrarily put their feet on the floor and then they press their feet into the ground and they say, well, I'm using good leg drive. And then they don't feel tension in any of these areas. So there's essentially no leg drive. Leg drive starts in your feet. So what I like to say, an easy cue. So let's just say, we're looking at uh, Sammy Sausage Head on the bench, and you're looking at him like from a bird's eye view. And he's trying to do some leg drive. We're gonna start at the feet. So leg drive is not just down into the floor and it's not just down and out either like you've probably heard it's more of a scoop into the floor and out of it what i mean by that is imagine a shovel right you're shoveling into and out of the dirt that's what you're going to try to do with your feet now this is the reason why when you know in powerlifting competitions when the floor is slippery as fuck or the bench is slippery as fuck, you're not able to employ proper leg drive because you're not able to really get that scooping sensation into the ground without your feet moving if there's no traction on the floor. So first and foremost, you're gonna wanna wear a shoe with traction and perform the bench press on a floor that has traction. It's really simple. Sit down in a chair like this and move yourself backwards with your feet. If you can do that, you can also do this on bench press. Now here's where leg drive comes into play. We said it's a bridge, right? So it's not any one of these forces acting independently. It's a couple different forces acting together. So 
this scooping force translates into your lower back. That's your arch. That's you extending your back, which is creating tension in your spinal erectors. This is the bridge. It's also potentiated by your obliques and your anterior core, your abs. Here's where that chain finishes. Your upper body, including your upper back, your neck, and of course your pressing muscles. This is where the, the force ends up getting pushed into. This is where the bench press comes into play. How you translate from here to here to here is that just like with a deadlift, we talk about you have to pre-pull slack into the bar. You should be pre-pushing into the bar with your upper body musculature at the same time that you're doing all this. And then hopefully your bench isn't slippery as well. If your bench is slippery, go ahead and just wrap a band around it long ways. You know you have it done all right when you feel an incredible pressure from your feet, going into your legs, going into your hips, going into your ass, going into your spinal erectors and into your core that ends up into the bar. And let's talk about different ways to employ leg drive and why Larson Press is very uh, intuitive to use for someone that's on the stronger side. When you're someone that's on the stronger side, being that you're recruiting this lower body musculature and you're flexing the shit out of it, the more weight that you lift on bench press, the more that you're going to have to fatigue those lower body muscles. Now, as you fatigue those lower body muscles with an upper body lift, you're taking away from your lower body lifts. I'm gonna link down to that Larson Press versus Close Grip Bench video. We talked about that there. Here's why Larson Press is an intuitive lift for advanced lifters, or advanced, quite honestly. Like if you're not benching at least 315 or fuck it, more than that, like 350, you shouldn't really be doing Larson press in my opinion. Leg drive is really only like tenable to do for like lower rep sets in, in my experience. That's like a golden tidbit. So let's just say you got Sammy Sausage Head here. He's doing his bench press. He's got the good leg drive and everything. And after his fifth rep, he has to release his leg drive because the tension is just too much. You can release and reactivate your leg drive. However, your positioning is gonna be slightly off when you do that. That's why a lot of times, if a power lifter is good anyway and they're strong, they'll do something like a Larson press. Not only are they getting more out of less weight, they're getting in the upper body volume with their bench pressing movement pattern without having to worry about a different performance or a shift in uh, positioning from readjusting their leg drive. All that they really realistically have to do is rebreathe. You can do that very easily without moving your body at all. Readjusting your leg drive comes into play with you know, readjusting your feet, releasing tension in your hips, breaking up this chain so that you can relieve some tension and then reactivate it. Larson Press is really good for just circumventing that factor altogether. Now you might be asking, okay, how do I know if I'm using good leg drive or not? Here's a simple test and here's the, the last thing that we're gonna cover on the video before we close up. Perform a Larson Press. If you do a Larson Press and it's exactly the same in loading and exertion as your regular you know, supposed competition style leg drive bench press, you don't know how to use leg drive. In short, you have to key into your spinal erectors, your hips, everything in your hips, so your glutes, your legs, your feet, upper back, and then tension into the bar as well. If you feel a full body brace from each and every one of these kinetic units, you know that you're doing leg drive correctly. If you only feel it here and you don't feel it here, here's where you need to put your attention to. Likewise, if you feel it here and you don't feel it here, 
here's where you need to give your attention to. And then if you feel it everywhere but here, here's where you need to give your attention to. Newer lifters or lifters that have not given attention to their leg drive have areas of opportunity in one or all of these areas collectively. Now in short, scapular movement. You have to master that first because that's just how you stop yourself from getting hurt. Next is building this bridge and third is knowing when to use a Larson press. Now, exceptions to like the 350 bench press rule. If you're someone that has an exceptionally strong lower body and there are some elite level power lifters that are like this, so let's just say you deadlift 750 and you squat 700 and then you bench press like 315. There are guys in the USAPL that legitly have these uh, like these type of training numbers and competition numbers. Larson press is still really good for you just because your lower body lifts are at such a level where like leg drive even from this can create fatigue. Extrapolate that down. So if you're someone that, you know, you bench 200, uh, let's just say you squat 500 and then you deadlift 585. A Larson press still may be the option for you, provided that you're actually using leg drive with this 200 bench. It's still fatigue that may bleed into these two lifts. So there's, I guess, I lie, there's two ways that you would do a Larson press. One is if you're an exceptionally strong bencher with a proportionately strong lower body that just doesn't want to take away from that training. Or if you're an exceptionally strong lower body lifter and you don't want to have any extra fatigue on your lower back at all, or your lower body musculature, you would use a Larson press. I hope this answers a lot of questions you shall have regarding basic bench mechanics and leg drive, things to watch out for, things to test for. Now, one last word that I want to leave with you is that there is no one size fits all way that you position your feet with your leg drive. It just comes down to practice. So some people you know, if the bench is here, and this is the end of the bench, some people do better with their feet here, more in front. Some people are more here. Some people put their feet more behind them and more to the side. You just play with each of these positions to see where you can generate the most force into your hips and into your lower back and eventually into your upper body. And that's just going to vary for everybody. I hope this has been helpful for everybody. Please leave me any questions that you have down below. There's no stupid questions when it comes to this, just because this will be the fucking video that I send people when they ask me about leg drive or bench setup. This is the video. So please leave any questions that you have. I appreciate y'all. Have a good one.